Hello, welcome to the intro to OpenGL shader tutorial for Google Code in 2018. During the tutorial, we'll be going over what shaders are as well as the basics of creating them. Before we actually begin the tutorial, we have to make some changes for the screen to actually display something. If you look in the scenes.rs file, you should see this piece of code. It's supposed to be rendering a triangle, but part of the code is missing. We're supposed to fill it in. So the EVO in the code is a list of indices of the VBO. The VBO is a list of attributes of vertices. For our program, each vertex in the VBO is only three numbers representing the position X, Y, and Z. This basically means that every vertex is three numbers, and the first number of each vertex is the X coordinate, the second number is the Y coordinate, and the third number is the Z coordinate. Given this, modify the VBO to draw a triangle on the screen. Try to make your triangle use these three specific vertices, the bottom left corner, the bottom right corner, and the top middle. I've included a graph with the OpenGL coordinates on the right corner, so hopefully this should help you in this task. Hopefully you came up with the same VBO that I did. You may have used a different order, but it should still work just fine. If we actually draw these three points on the OpenGL coordinate graph, we do see that it actually gives us a triangle. So the first point is negative 1, negative 1, 0. Now for these three points, z is always going to equal 0 just because we're making a 2D triangle. So if I go to the graph here and go to negative 1, negative 1, I do get the bottom left corner. Now if I go to the second point, it is 1, negative 1, 0. So over here on the right on the x-axis and down, so that gives me the bottom right corner. And the third point is 0, 1, 0. So that's in the middle, but all the way to the top, so that does give us the top middle. And then the EVO lets us draw a face between these three points. So it does draw the face between these three points, which should hopefully give us a triangle once we are done with our shader. For the last step before getting started with shaders, we must fix a couple of bugs found in shape.rs. In the constructor, change the way that Tris is declared, so change it to the way you find on the top line here. And in shape render function, replace gl.drawElements with the line shown right here. So actually replace it with this bottom line that I'm underlining. This is just because of the way that OpenGL works. If we did it with the other draw call, we wouldn't be able to see anything even with a shader. Great, so let's actually get started with shaders. Before we actually develop our own, it would be helpful to know what they are first. Shaders are programs that run on the GPU to directly display graphics on the screen. A GPU or a graphics processing unit is a computer chip designed to make displaying graphics easier. Even if your computer doesn't have its own standalone or dedicated graphics card, your CPU has one built in or else you wouldn't be watching this video right now. In order to fully calculate the color for every pixel on your screen, shaders are run in parallel or at the same time in order to make this process more efficient. Shaders, for our purpose, are in a language called GLSL, short for OpenGL Shading Language. GLSL looks a lot like the C language, so it shouldn't be hard to pick up at all. Shaders accept two types of inputs, attributes, and uniforms. The difference between these two is that uniforms have a constant value between all copies of a shader, while attributes have different values for all copies of the shader. The two types of shaders that we're going to be going over today are Vertex and Fragment. The Vertex shader, like its name suggests, decides the modified attributes of each vertex. This can include positions, colors, normals, and even texture coordinates, but we only have positions for now. Every vertex will have a copy of the vertex shader run on it with the same uniforms but different attributes. Remember that uniforms are consistent between separate instances of each shader, but attributes are different between these instances. The fragment shader, also called the pixel shader, decides the color of each pixel on a screen. Every pixel inside a face will have a fragment shader run on it. One important distinction to make is that data only enters the vertex shader directly and is then passed on to the fragment shader. The process of passing data from the main program to the vertex shader and then this data getting passed on to the fragment shader is known as the graphics pipeline. In our program, the vertices will be the VBO points that we created at the beginning of the tutorial to display the triangle, so they're just the VBA positions that we said earlier. The vertex shader runs once for each of these vertices, setting the vertices in the correct positions. Then the fragment shader is run on the pixels in between to fill in the colors of the pixels. Another important distinction to make is that up until the fragment shader, nothing has actually been put on the screen yet. The vertex shader runs with the points of the vertices, not the actual pixels, so it's dealing with data, not pixels. 
GLSL is simple, but it's definitely data centric. There are three basic data types in GLSL, a bool, a true or false value, int, an integer, and float, a floating point or decimal number. GLSL builds on these by providing vectors, which can just be thought of as a series of numbers. You can perceive these complex data types with i and b in order to use booleans and integers instead of floats, respectively. Each vertex position can be accessed through vec.x, vec.y, vec.z, and vec.w, so you can definitely modify the individual um, attributes of a vector. Matrices are a square series of numbers uh, made of, of floats. Something that is more important in GLSL than other programming languages is the idea of data precision. While most other programming languages would allow 1.0 over 1 to automatically become a decimal number, GLSL requires all numbers to be explicitly casted or upcasted in order to calculate with. Because OpenGL tries to create the most accurate graphics possible, GLSL doesn't support the use of data casting because it could just lead to some data loss and that would be inaccuracy. Every shader created using GLSL follows a general structure. At the top of the file, shaders declare their inputs, which can either be uniforms or attributes in our case. After that, programs can use helper functions to organize code throughout the file. Ultimately, the shader program must have a void main function that is called by the system, hopefully to set the values of the outputs. The intro to OpenGL source code has a lot of code disabled for suppressing errors. Before uncommenting this code, create two files, shader.glslv and shader.glslf, the vertex and fragment shader respectively. After doing this, uncomment the first few lines from the image displayed. They're not in line order, so you may have to jump around within the file. The lines uncommented allow scene to have its own shader program. It will also initialize shader program named my shader and create a scene with its own shader program. Because there was an old constructor that didn't use my shader, go ahead and comment it out and use the new one instead. Because every GLSL shader requires at the least a main function, create a main function in both shader.glslv and shader.glslf. Try compiling the program at this point just to check if you've modified uh, scenes.rs the right way. If it doesn't work, go back to the basics, bug fixes, and the previous slides to look at some of the modifications that we made. If it does compile, we can continue on to creating our own shaders and hopefully get something displayed. For the next couple of slides, we're going to be going in pipeline order as to retain that information. So we're going to create our vertex shader first. Following the structure of a GLSL shader, we must first declare our inputs. There are two inputs in our program, the position in 3D space and the MVP matrix. If you look at different locations in shaders.rs, you'll be able to see where both of these values are set. In the constructor, the first and only piece of data of each vertex is being set as called position, while in set MVP matrix, the function, the uniform is being set across all instances of the vertex shader. The position is the same set of values that we created in our VBO, so it's the triangle that we created on the first slide. On each instance of the vertex shader, a different set of attributes is used to create a vertex. So we're going to have a different vertex shader run for the bottom left, bottom right, and top middle point. Vertex shaders ultimately should set the value of one variable, gl underscore position. Now gl position is a vector that should contain four floats, the new x coordinate, y coordinate, z coordinate, and the depth value for the vertex. We'll set GL position as the product between the MVP matrix and the position that we put inside of our VBO. GLSL allows you to create bigger vectors out of smaller ones as seen with VEC4 and position right here. While just setting GL position to the VEC4 of position would work, we multiply it by the MVP matrix in order to make sure it can be affected by a camera. This doesn't actually mean anything now, but you can watch the matrix tutorial after this one to find out why we do this and what it makes possible. Just to review that we're on the same page, here's the full source code of the vertex shader that we just created. Before trying to run it, we'll go ahead and make the fragment shader just to finish up the pipeline and make sure that pixel colors are actually being set. Our vertex shader isn't offering any data to the fragment shader, so any inputs aren't necessary. 
Um, remember how I said that fragment shaders get all the data accessed from the vertex shader? Our vertex shader isn't actually communicating anything at the end. It's just setting the value of GL position. So nothing actually does get passed to the fragment shader. If you want to learn more about how fragment shaders can receive data from the vertex shader, look at the documentation for varying and high DP keywords. Um, in GLSL, frag color serves as the equivalent to GL position as we must set it somewhere in the main function. GL frag color, much like GL position, except a vector four, but it actually represents a color. The colors are red, blue, green, and alpha respectively, and are scaled 0.0 to 1.0 instead of 0 to 255. In our code sample, we set the color to 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, which is equivalent to the white color. While it is a little short, just make sure that the fragment shader is accurate with the one on the screen. If you try running your program, you should hopefully now see the white triangle that we programmed. The actual vertices are decided in the VBO and scenes.rs, which are then transferred to the vertex shader. The vertex shader just allocates the MVP matrix with a VEC4 of the position. And then the fragment shader sets all of the pixel colors in between to white so we can actually see a triangle. Before I ended the tutorial, I wanted to go over the specific goals that must be completed in order for the intro to open GL task to be completed. You must create a unique design making use of at least three open GL triangles with three colors. From this point onwards, our vertex shader should be fine for this because it will use whatever vertice attributes are passed into it from the VBO. In order to actually create multiple triangles, you can take the shape created for you in scenes.rs and create multiple copies of it. Additionally, you can modify the EBO and VBO to display more than just one face using more than three points, but they would have to be displayed in the same color using our current fragment shader. In order to actually display different colors, make multiple copies of the fragment shader file and use different colors other than white. So change some of those 1.0s to different colors and see what colors they actually give you. Thanks for watching. I hope that you have learned a lot from this tutorial and have the knowledge necessary to finish Enter to OpenGL. If you want to learn more about other things that you can do to add aspects to your own program, watch the Matrix and Buffer tutorial from Copyleft Games in order to learn more.